We are right. Welcome everybody to the first meeting of the Central Otago District Council for this year. We will start with Karakia, led by Councillor Tana Ali. Thank you. Kia hora, te marino. Kia fatapapa, tonamo, te moana. Te hora hi matato itine rana. Aruha atu, aruha mai. Tato kia tato katoa. Homie, huie, kaya kiri. A peace be widespread. May the sea be like greenstone, a pathway for us all this day. Give love, receive love. Let us show respect for each other. Join together, unite. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, we have no apologies today, which is marvellous. Great to see everybody here. So we will move to public forum. No, we will not. I'll move to the first thing the first item. How we don't have public forum, right? No, I knew exactly what I was doing. I just didn't know what I was doing. So <laughs> confirmation of the minutes. Confirmation of the minutes. Yeah, two minutes into the year, and I'm struggling with reading minutes. Uh, the minutes from the 21st of December uh, on our tablets at page seven. Somebody was here would like to move those are true and correct. So I presume they are. Team, thank you. Seconded, Tracy. Any challenges to that? No. All in favour? Mm. Aye. And against carried. Declarations of interest councillors are, of course, reminded to be vigilant and stand aside from decision making when a conflict arises between their role as a member and any private or other external interest they may have, and to update their declarations on page 10 and 12, which does take us to our reports. And the first one, so I got confused because it's speaking from the public to talk to us in that. Rebecca, it's all yours. I should be quiet. Oh, thank you. And thank you, um, everybody. Happy New Year for those I didn't attend a chance to say hello to first. Um, I've really got nothing further to add to my report except to say that I've really enjoyed working alongside both the Heritage Trust and the Arts Trust since I've been appointed to this role. Um, and I really look forward to working with both organisations in this next year, um, particularly as we work towards a community wellbeing um, framework and a district vision and, and how arts and culture fits and heritage fits into that those pieces of work. So um, we have the Arts Trust first and then the Heritage. Would you like them to come up separately? Or? I just want to say that one of my New Year's resolutions this year was that I wasn't going to forget when it's other people's papers and I got off to an immediate flight yeah. stop by forgetting that this is Tamer's paper, so it's Tamer to you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, maybe if we do the Arts Trust Great. first and then we've got plenty of room. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's Jan, actually, not Rebecca. Rebecca's my left hand girl. Um, so I'm going to be speaking to you this morning um, and thanking you very much for giving us the opportunity to speak to our accountability report and also for your continued support for the arts in Central Otago. I must say we've certainly felt some definite post-pandemic positivity and recovery within this regional arts sector. We've got evidence of this through engagement with and direct contact from arts practitioners throughout New Zealand and also from overseas. But there's a genuine wish and interest in being involved in what is happening in the arts in Central Otago. We see visitors wishing to purchase local art, we see artists from outside the region wishing to showcase their skills, their performances and shows and exhibitions within our region. In other words, our principal aim in our strategy of establishing Central Otago as a recognised arts destination is certainly being realised. With only 20 hours a week available to her, our coordinator is experiencing greater demand for her services and a pressure to be more available. However, there is only so much she can accomplish within that time frame. And as a trust, we believe she more than delivers the requirements of our strategy. And our trustees also commit many volunteer hours on an annual basis. The first of our Cover to Cover Authors Talks finally took place in December. It was highly successful with attendees coming from all corners of Central Otago, Southern Lakes and Dunedin, and most expressed a strong desire for more events of this nature. And we now have a good database of people and a sound format for future events. 
The Clyde Dam project, the power, the power that flows through us, was a new multimedia, multi-site public installation by Matthew Galloway, which focused on the legacy and impact of the Clyde Dam and Robert Muldoon's Think Big policy of the early 1980s. The project employed drone footage, sculpture, archival political cartoons, a newspaper publication, and recorded interviews. It was effectively overseen by Rebecca in collaboration with the artist. Both of these projects strengthened the profile of the arts in Central Otago and its contribution to the New Zealand art scene as a whole. Where budget allows, we continue to make changes to ensure our website remains up to date, organic and active. The addition of Instagram buttons for our artists to highlight their work is one of our latest additions. The 2023-24 year will see us working in collaboration alongside a number of local agencies with the Art Department at Cromwell College, where the aim is firstly to help make the arts more inspiring and also to connect the arts in the college with arts-related projects within the community. They wish to identify and open up more opportunities for pupils to engage in arts activities outside their own school environment and curriculum. And they're now working on their own art strategy, which has stemmed from discussions with us and assistance from us some time ago. Working with Clyde Museum, who are working towards another arts related exhibition in March. We will be once again presenting the top art portfolios in April. And several options have arisen for mural projects, two in Alexandra and one in Cromwell, and all of these are in various stages of development. The multicultural mural project in Cromwell will hopefully be achieved early in 2023 in collaboration with the CODC welcoming communities. A further iteration of Chorus Box Art will take place in 2023. We have plans for a pre-loved art sale, which will be a fundraiser. Governance, support and promotion for artists across all media will be ramped up as we lobby major government arts funding organisations for project funding. Why is it that just two of 69 projects funded by Creative New Zealand in the November 2022 funding round were awarded to Otago. The Trust is attempting to establish why so little government funding comes to the South Island, let alone a specific region such as ours, even though it has a strong pedigree and provenance in the arts. And one of our trustees is carrying out research and investigation into this anomaly. Although in an embryonic stage, we are researching the possibility and feasibility of commissioning large scale sculptural works which would sit imposingly in and on the central Otago landscape and tell the story of migration within the area, past and present. These would be world-class works of very high quality, which would encourage people to travel to the region to view. And finally, thank you again for your financial support and also for your genuine interest in what we do. We really appreciate it and we wouldn't exist otherwise. And I must conclude by saying that it's been an absolute pleasure to work with Rebecca. Both Rebecca's this week. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. That's a wonderful report. Some really exciting things coming up, especially for Cromwell College students. Yes, yes, I think so. Yes, it's been on it's been on the boiler for a wee while, but then it was starting to there are lots of things now that are just sort of starting to jump start. Correct. I think because of the last few years where things have been a bit slow. Yeah. Very exciting. Has anybody got any questions for Jan or Rebecca? Oh. I've just got one thing to add, if I may. Yes. Um, the, the Chorus Box project, which um, has been hugely helped by Rebecca um, at the Arts Trust, has been such a delight to be part of. And every year there's a calendar that Chorus produces of, of the mm. top. Um, the top artworks around the country, and our one of our boxes of Miller's flat features in this year's calendar. So that's quite a coup. So that's good. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I just saw that we are just around by the courthouse, doing the, the turtle, and she's uh, been in the sun for hours and hours and hours. Thank you. Yeah. But it's a, it's a really lovely thing for um to get young people involved in mm -hmm. and, and that's really exciting for us as well. Yeah. 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 Great. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome, Dad. Thank you. <coughs> um.
Right. Thanks, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. On behalf of the Central Otago Heritage Trust, I would like to thank Council for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I propose to give a brief outline of the trust role, note some recent achievements, and provide a brief comment on where we see our future direction going. Established in 2008, the Central Otago Heritage Trust is a membership based organisation. Our eight trustees are appointed by Central Otago's major heritage organisations to represent their collective interests for the protection, preservation, and celebration of Central Otago heritage. Our role was initially defined in the 2012 Community Consultation Document towards better heritage outcomes. The community led aspirations for our heritage are still reflected in our 2001 2004 strategic plan. The Trust has received annual financial support from the Council since 2019. This has enabled us to employ a part time heritage coordinator to coordinate the activities in our strategic plan. We're now well on the way to delivering some great outcomes against the tasks we've set in our latest plan. These tasks fall under three overarching goals. Firstly, to support the guardians of the Central Otago heritage by identifying, record, protect and preserve our heritage. <coughs> Secondly, working together across the sector to enhance best practice for protecting and managing our heritage. And thirdly, and very importantly, celebrating Central Otago's diverse and rich heritage. I'd like to summarise some of our recent achievements. Our membership has grown to 21 organisations that have a focus on heritage. We have developed a strong rapport with many of our members by providing assistance with funding and grant applications, promoting heritage initiatives taking place across the sector, identifying opportunities for collaboration and resource sharing. An example of this was our role in the development of the Central Otago Museums Trust over the last 18 months. And we have assumed an advocacy role for the sector. We do this through proactively engaging in heritage resource planning matters at district and regional and contributing to formal submission processes. We were pleased to offer feedback during the drafting of the Heritage Precinct Guidelines. The trust has been advocating for such guidelines over the last few years. We appreciate having Anne Rogers as the council liaison at our board meetings, where she has kept us up to date with the wider heritage planning matters. We've developed and are, de developed and are delivering a program of heritage seminars in the community. We published our quarterly printed and electronic newsletters, and further work has been completed on our website, events calendar, and resource library. These communications have contributed towards bringing the heritage sector and the wider Central Otago community together to share and learn. We now have 68 oral histories in the repository, preserving stories on a wide range of topics across the district. Council's financial support has helped us leverage additional funding for our oral history program. Looking ahead, there is much to do. We need to get our oral histories out to the community through an easily accessible online platform, similar to the service provided by Clutha District, Southland District and Dunedin City Council. We're keen to discuss this possibility with Council in the near future. We will continue to advocate for greater awareness of our heritage, of how heritage contributes to our economic, social and cultural well-being. We see an opportunity to strengthen the link between arts, culture and heritage sectors to support a collective focus on a vibrant, attractive and thriving district. We'd like to explore this cross collaboration within the context of the new intergenerational destination management plan for Central Otago. The trunk will continue discussions with Council on establishing a heritage award as part of the biennial Central Otago Awards program. Such an award would give recognition to the hard work and commitment within our heritage community. We will keep working alongside Council on addressing heritage aspects of the district review, district plan review. For example, the work undertaken by the Otago Goldfields Heritage Trust has shown that for every heritage site that is reviewed, 
about three more are identified. These sites are recorded on ARC site, the New Zealand Archaeological Association's recording scheme. We wish to work with Council to see how this work can assist in the updating of Schedule 19.4 of the District Plan and Council's GIS planning tools. The 2012 Community Consultation Document Towards Better Heritage Outcomes needs a refresh. We would like to work with Council this year to reassess community aspirations for the protection, preservation, management and celebration of Central Otago's heritage. Finally, on behalf of the Heritage Trust, I'd like to thank Council for the ongoing support you provide to our heritage community. Thank you. Thank you, David and Lady, for your wonderful work. I'm very excited at the prospect of the oral histories being available to the public. That's going to be wonderful. Absolutely. That was fundamental to the whole program being set up. So yeah. we'll be there soon. Anybody have any questions? I've got a question on that one, Tamer. The oral history is, is it not as simple as getting a YouTube channel and putting it up on that. I mean, that seems a simple solution. D data protection is absolutely core to it. So the, right from doing the oral histories through to um, the way they are then available yeah. has to be in a fairly well protected or understood environment. And, and YouTube may play with some clips out of it, but we don't see that as where the repository will be. YouTube, but YouTube is more for imagery rather than audio. Yeah. There are yeah. similar platforms, but um, we do have to be mindful of, as they can see, the rights yeah. and um, the downloading and just the yeah, people taking clips and dropping them into something yeah. else and yeah. stuff. Yeah, it makes sense. It's just, I'm mean, eager to hear Such yeah. a great collection that you're putting together. Congratulations on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we now move to item 23.1.3. Oh, sorry, receiving our report. Can I have someone who that was a report be received? Neil, thank you. Second, Sally, thank you very thanks. much. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. Now we move to item 23.1.3. Gordon and David, memorials, please. Thanks for that. So, uh, yeah, the uh, draft memorials policy. So, well, we don't have uh, a lot of requests coming through. Well, especially since uh, the pandemic. Um, what well, we do get mainly for trees and park uh, benches. I think it's important we do have a memorials policy just so that the process is clear for both those the people who want to donate something and council um, that go through the start go through the process and make sure it's consistent. Um, so we need a policy that provides that clear direction. Um, as part of this it doesn't include uh, headstones and things and cemeteries that dealt with, it, with a separate process and has um, large monuments and artworks and things like that will come back to the either the relevant board or the council for any decisions on those so they were made by staff just because of, uh, of their um, yeah is the impact on the community so just more things that we get big lists for so I'm happy to answer the first place. Okay. Thank you. Uh, after a couple of relatively high profile errors in other regions over memorials, I think it is appropriate that we have something that sets out some relatively clear guidance. Mm. That's right. Does anybody, Tracy? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I know the report talks about what's happened in the past. Do we need to be more? I don't know if this is the right word, but you know, deliberate in what we've done, uh, uh, I guess, acknowledge what we've done in the past in the actual. I'm not, I'm just, I'm just wondering whether we could, under the new policy, we, we could be, uh, I guess, criticised for not following what we did do now. Or is that something that we, is it just, it's just looking retrospectively. And I'm wondering if we if we're going to come under any plaque for that. Something sort of all of that's current. Yeah, perhaps in order. I I don't know whether that's appropriate or 
just so that we can say, I mean, you, you guys might already have that available with the list. And mm -hmm. so. So you're saying as an audit of what we've done in the past and why the need for this policy and be really clear on that for people. So it does what we've currently got. What meets by and large meet the policy in the existing markets. Um, seats in Pioneer Park, I think it's still there. Um, you know, the, it's, there's like a contradiction, there's nothing in the system which is contradiction about the new policy. I think in recent years, uh, we this policy reflects what our process is. Yes. Um, I don't know how far back you go because things have been donated to a long time. You know, there's gates to Pioneer Park put in 1911 or something like that. So, um, I'm not yeah. sure if you want to go back that far, but I'm sure in the last four or five years, there's certainly been a, this process has been followed for um, three weeks that we've had. I think we would have heard or been brought to our attention if we did anything out there which was offensive or particularly you know, in breach of what the policy is. No, that's right. It was just a, just just a and like you say, it might be that we can actually, if there was a question, we could acknowledge and say that there was, uh, within the last five, six years, we've actually followed a very similar process. Yeah. Um, and I guess going on to that, you, in relation to the repair replacement, I didn't write the page number down, sorry. Um, it's very broad, which gives us a lot of um, the ability to say whether we want uh, that memorial to be repaired or replaced. Mm -hmm. Uh, bearing in mind that sometimes the memorials come from there's quite an emotional attachment to that. How do you, is that, um, I guess it was just a little bit. I was just conscious of would we perhaps put a time frame on something, and then that's. I'm just wondering if it's so broad that we're going to end up with uh, if something like let's say it was a park bench mm -hmm. and it was removed. Really, just, it, it'd been there for a hundred years. <laughs> Are we going to come under flak because we haven't set a time frame that memorials uh, are absolutely guaranteed to be there mm -hmm. for a set time? Or in, the, in reverse, how do we preserve what's been uh, that memorial if we were going to replace it mm -hmm. or if we were going to take it away and not have it? I think um, when somebody donates something, it becomes council. Yeah. Yeah, I understood that. Manage. And things, you know, even trees die or blow over or whatever, and park benches get vandalized. So we would normally repair those for a repair or replace a tree if it's, you know, within 10, 15 years, I guess. So it's roughly. Yeah. Um, after that, we need to give some consideration for, for that because the site might not be, because other things might have grown for a tree that they're signing now on, no, not quite appropriate for the tree. Mm -hmm. And a part of it similar and similarly, I think. But we would try and what we've done in the past is contact with the family who have got still got that context for those yeah. or whoever donated and say, well, it's no longer fit for purpose, or we've got to move it, or it's died or something, we're going to replace it because sometimes a tree that kind is maybe inappropriate to grow nowadays. So we can do that sort of stuff where we can. Yeah. But and we could be more specific when that was required. Mm -hmm. well, but after all, it's a capital free. asset and yeah. we maintain it, it's great for us paying for the cost of that, yeah. whatever it is going forward. Could I add, add to that perhaps? It's a really good point, Tracy, because there is a lot of emotion attached yeah. to this. It's part of the reason why it's mm -hmm. framework, mm -hmm. framework in place. And so um, one of the things that Gordy and I have been talking about, what it does to us gives us the ability to be really clear with people um, about terms and conditions around the placement of the memorial mm -hmm. and that if it's a council they said it may not be replaced there may be development of the area even if it was replaced mm -hmm. and the measures that we go through so that because without the framework in place kind of, well, you can have those conversations but there's nothing to fall back on or well this will be sort of a form of this um <coughs> on the way through but you're right 100 years from now mm -hmm. there's certainly some things you always want there and other things that might not be as relevant mm -hmm. Yeah, it was just that emotional attachment. I think sometimes family or districts can have two things like that. So. Yeah. Just a thing. 
Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, just a couple. Um, within the policy on page 22 of our agenda, it talks about um, on the subject, no new memorials be considered that commemorate a personal or or occasion already memorised in the same ward. It's just like road names, I have a real problem just because it's a ward, it's just a line on a map. And there might be a good reason why you have something in common, whether they have something similar or the same in tariffs because of the connections. I just think that you're just making a rock, we're making a rock right back. It doesn't actually let us reflect something that's appropriate. Yeah. So I just think that that's that's a really that's a that's a no. Yeah. And you go, really? Yeah. Unless it's a good reason, it should we know? I agree, but I don't think you put a policy that says no at the outset. And we do know, I think, in our district, there are some things that do have a connection between more than one place. Yeah. yeah. And I just think that that's making a wildfire own back. Yeah. And picking up on the um, comments from Tracy and others is that I think it's really important that we actually know where these things that we've got are. Yeah. Um, you know, who knows? Especially the founder in Cromwell. I think 99% of the people in Cromwell have no idea. Yeah. Because it's not been recorded somewhere, and my body's here, but when he leaves, no one else will know. Um, you know, we should know with this such of it. If we're going to let, if we're going to have a policy, we need to actually have some sort of register of those assets. So when it comes in 20 years' time, it's going to be replaced or whatever. We actually know the history and background because we're all gone. And and then you don't know that you've actually ended up offended someone. And you find out 10 years later um, that no one was here. Cecil Anderson Memorial Payment <laughs> or Hell Brothers because we did something that no one had knowledge of. And then the original benefactors. Brandy started to come back and says, says this here, there, there, and, and we looked at the city for a while, about 15 years ago. So I just think it's really important that we the policy reflects that we'll have a register and we'll keep it up, 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 up to date so we know what we've got. We do all the other assets, but we should know the history. Thanks. Just I'll respond to that. So um, just on the last one, we, uh, we are capturing those assets and photographing class on the critical sense uh, as we go as part of our asset management. Um, Process, so we have not more yet. But that's <coughs> just think the policy should actually incorporate the fact that's, that they will be recorded in the asset register or some in the charts and records, so the history is not lost. Could be, yeah, we, yeah, we can do that. But it has to be done anyway as part of our maintenance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I wonder if the other one, um, maybe memorials will be considered on case by case basis that can commemorate. There's already yeah, that, that, that to me makes more sense. Yeah, I think okay. it could be that. So there would be maybe, let's say, at a low level. Yeah, that's no. <laughs> but, but I might decide that it's appropriate to uh, have a seat in all of the places somebody I loved um, <laughs> yeah. liked going. Yeah. And so you want to be able to give staff with the ability to no. that. Right. But at the same time, if there's a good reason why there might be a significant memorial in place for something that would come back to the appropriate governing bod government's body for that decision. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a, um, a, a line like what you said, or something that says, um, we're appropriate, this will be referred yeah. to the Community Board of Council. Mm -hmm. and the other thing that just concerns me, not, not concern me <coughs> is that a lot of places we think we want to put stuff is not our land. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, mm -hmm. the one of great expectation you're going to start sticking stuff around Lake Dunstan yeah. or Lake Moxborough or wherever else where we don't fall dock reserves and those sort of things. So that's pretty clear in the policy, but just a lot of the fact that there could always be an expectation saying, oh, the council are going to go. And sometimes we've even tried to approve stuff that we've all of a sudden tried through the process and put some out. Yeah. I think that. Cool. Thank you. I think the classic example is, and um, Stu's not here, but I think this is a Chet McKnight who passed last year, and many of Toto was a life member of eight different clubs, many of them sporting clubs. So the Bonds wants to put a seat up, yeah. and the Rugby Club wants to put a seat up, that would stop that, which would, wouldn't be right. So I think that's a good part. Um, Tracy's comment, I wonder if maybe putting in here that this policy doesn't apply to any memorials pre existing classing of the policy. So you've still got open. Nobody's going to come along and go, oh, that seat there doesn't fit this. Or, well, yeah. it doesn't matter because we're already there. They might just cover that. Yeah. Um, I heard a couple of times. This might sound silly, but I don't, I'm not sure it is. There's nothing here that says that the person being memorialised has to be dead. <laughs> and I say that because we want to plant a tree for Granddad while he's still alive. Yeah. And then Granddad, I remember when they put Hillary on the $5 note, everyone was worried that he behaved himself for the rest of his life. Mm. You know, so maybe we just want to consider um, that that's a, an entry level requirement. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, but can I? Well, no, I mean, that's 
Yeah, because um, sometimes it's it's probably it's a bit like you know, I say, well, I'll just recognise the person while they're still here. Yeah. So I think I, I get what you're saying, mm. but again, it probably needs to be thought about saying, is that what about about yeah. I yeah. think that a statue for Richie Memorial, which I know is in my thing in another part of the country, is different. So this is memorials in memory of, mm. um, in a sense, and one of the things we've talked about is making that staff do the due diligence to actually make sure the person. But is the, is. but we want to be either way. Yeah. It clear that this, if, if somebody does want to build a seat for Grandad, this should still apply. So maybe I'm turning myself right around and go that we need to clarify that this can, that this does apply to living people as well. Because I think your point's well made. Mm. You could just say memorial would not clarify living or dead. And the more you sound like you did though. Yes. Mm -hmm. more necessarily. I've got lots of memories of people still alive, including you. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're trying to count it so it can, can have both. You can not have a memorial rather than. A just memorial for a deceased person. Yes. Um, mm. Trees for bad, uh, isn't Yeah, trees for bad. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's quite a lot of uh, yeah. which here yeah, from yeah. Um, the people from the Yeah. Mm. I had a couple of other things and I'm still struggling with my notes on this. Uh, just under materials on page 43 of our um, Agenda it says council council will purchase the seat or tree directly and invoice the applicant. I think tree should say um, living memorial just in case it's a rose bush. It just use the same terminology today. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure I had a third thing, but it can't have been that important because I can't find it. Um, mm -hmm. No, I can't find it. So I guess it can't bring that important. Thank you. Thank you. No uh, can I uh, recommendations on page 38A uh, that the council receive the report and accept the significant level of significance and B adopts the draft Central Otago District Council Memorials Policy 2020. Thank you. Seconded, Sarah. All in favour? Right. Right. Against? Carried. Now uh, I am able to. Would you like it to come back to you too? Thank you, Tamer. Is it my turn now? No. Well, no, it's going to Nigel. Shall I go? You should have called and sent me filed again. It's yours. It's because of this thing. I'm still trying to work with new technology. Okay. We're just going to. Because it comes up with things that we wanted to hand out because we are aware that it's even difficult to read these things. So we're just going to talk about that one. Even it's not just the matrix. Difficult to read that one. No, I wouldn't do that. I love that thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, Okay, we've got item number 22.1.4 on page 62 of your agenda. And I wanted just to talk on this report before I asked Chantal and Julie to go through it because this is important. The report outlines the capital works program for three waters between now and June 30th, 2024. This is a more useful way of thinking than thinking in terms of financial years or LTPs. We are aiming to get the projects listed done and we'll spend $54 million to do it. Outlining the program in this way allows us to arrange our debt financing in the most beneficial way. It will also give our suppliers and contractors clear information so that they can plan their businesses as we hit and they head towards transition. Completing this works program will be a, a big challenge for this council and for the Three Waters team. Julie suggested when we were talking about it half in the fund that we need a big thermometer on the wall like a fundraiser model <laughs> so that we can see progress each month. Not a bad idea, I thought. 
Maybe instead we could email out a monthly update to councillors. Projects completed, money spent. Lastly, the program set out below underlines the major gap that losing three water three waters creates in our organisation. 30% or more of our business, loss of local control and local democracy. It's really quite sad when you look at it. But that's what we're going to do, and then it's going to go. So with those comments, Chantelle, Julie, thank you. So I'm going to introduce this, and then Chantelle's going to give you a bit more detail to find some of that key points. So um, as, as Nigel said, the headline here really is that um, we are proposing to spend $54 million um, over 20, it is actually over 24 months, um, but we are only seven months of that 24 and a half. So we have spent um, 14 million already that is um, spent um, of that over the last seven years. Um, so we do need to um, do a little bit to get through this. Um, of, of that 54, 6.8 million is, is reserves um, and is part of the um, transitional guidance that we're being given from the National Travel the Department of the Affairs National Transition Unit is that we should try to spend the educational reserves that we have prior to transition. So that's why we have that $6.8 million in there. And that is made up of um, point, just under $1.9 million of a reserve that we have on stormwater depreciation more depreciation and then the rest is DC income and there's a bit of detail in the report about where that's coming from and should tell us back to that further. Um, it, is, it is big ask to get through this. Our team have um, identified as one of the objectives that they want to achieve for um, the, the National Transition Unit talks about day one being 1st of July 2024 and um, we're talking about um, last day being the 30th of June 2024. So we'll, we've sat and talked about where do we want to be as, as, as a team at the 30th of June 2024 and what's important to, to the team, the counselling community. And, and right at the top of that list is um, spending the money that's been raised in this community, um, in the community prior to transition. So one, what I would say though is as a fallback position, if we don't get those reserves spent, both the development contributions and the stronger ones, there is a commitment from the DIA that those will be spent in the areas that they have been um, raised for. And with development contributions, that's a legal, legal requirement to do that. Um, so, yeah, that's probably my oversight. Can tell what we um, jump into. Oh, oh, one other thing, um, just in terms of this, this is um, largely around, this isn't adding in new projects that we've in our long-term plan largely, it's about reshuffling the time of some of them because a big part of what we've spent um, the last few weeks doing is going through the program in detail, identifying realistically, what do we believe we can deliver and which projects do we have, are we, we being realistic about and saying they're not going to be built by the 30th of June 2024. And so examples here, um, the two key ones really are that upgrade at the centers in the Mania Toto and in Omicau where, where considerable investigation and design work is required to be able to address those. So we will focus on that investigation and design work, but there's no point us setting aside budget to build them because all that will happen is that will reduce the debt that transferred to the entity. We have reprogrammed those projects into the capital program for the entity for construction. Um, but what we're saying is that funding that's been raised can now be, could be reallocated to other projects that were in the long term plan, but maybe sitting in there for. There's also um, a number of projects that we had in the long term plan for years two and three that subsequently were funded from um, or contributed towards from the stimulus funding that we received. So we had funding that was provided for that can also be the other. So that's where the juggling kind of round is coming. It's not um, changing what we committed to our community to deliver. It's just around the time of that. Mm -hmm. So obviously Appendix 1 can print out a free in front of you. Um, and this kind of summarises all of the key changes throughout the whole program. And the key reasons for changes include the deliverability within 18 months, which you just 
just talked about um, legislative changes for water safety, compliance considerations, and our accumulated reserves in the three of those activities. Um, so legislative changes for water safety including a requirement for continuous monitoring to be added to our schemes. Um, the most cost effective and least risky option to do this is to actually install compliance monitoring devices throughout the networks. Um, the estimated cost of that is $600,000 and in the proposed program we will offset that by reducing the renewals in our part assets. Um, and also compliance, we've got an abatement notice on the rocks for a wastewater treatment plant until 31st of May 2023. Um, so in the proposal, we're recommending bringing forward $500,000 of operational expenditure from year I believe it is, to desludge the plant to make, uh, to build a bit more capacity in it to hopefully relieve us of the abatement notice. Um, other than that, the rest is just growth related um, and we have got a summary of the development contributions including the estimated development contributions up until 30th of January 2024. The largest reserve there is in Cromwell which is why we've reprioritised quite a few of the Cromwell growth projects mm -hmm. into the program. Um, so just in terms of that reduction um, on the plant renewals for water to offset the compliance monitoring, when we actually looked at the water plants, we said, well, given that we're about to um, do significant grades on pretty much all of them, it didn't really make sense to, um, to keep on renewing um, infrastructure in there that's about to be replaced anyway as part of the upgrade program. So we don't believe that will have any impact on Quality or the legal sense of quality services. Any, uh, and now we've got a little kind of diagram. Do we have any? Which of them? So, um, in terms of that, um, we've got that um, government up, uh, which entails um, the developed a dashboard that will actually enable us to report monthly on um, how we're tracking. Um, it shows all the projects that are on the left um, in the annual budget. In, um, in the middle, um, the left hand side's got the, um, the thermometer, and the right hand side gives a little bit of information about the stage at which those program projects are in um, in the project deliverable phasing. Um, so what we really need to do is shift as much of that um, at 21 million sitting in the red um, get it into um, design and procurement. Some things we can move through quite quickly. Um, so while it looks red and it looks scary at the moment, there's um, some some projects don't take a lot of design. They're just a case of getting procurement underway and we're about to we move them we move through. We expect to be at, um, towards the end of this financial year, we think we should have $35 million um, pretty much in the procurement phase. Um, there's probably about $15 million of work that the defense um going to be a risk of delivering in that timeline of work being all cards on the table then. Okay. So an awful lot of information in there. Um, well, Judy, so questions. Yeah, I've just got one. Um, and this is top of the three quarters total um, forecast is shown the June from the quarters 1.89. At the top of that page, I suspect that should be 6.806. That 1.89 is just the um, stormwater total. Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah. Where is that now, sorry? Oh, it's just on the, on the page. Yes, yeah, so that's just, um, that, that yeah. second column showing, is that on the last page? Yeah, that's one. That's just the, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so the key thing just to understand that 30 June 24 figure, okay, that is the, um, uh, in the recommendation you put there is the change from what's in the um, annual plan. So that's the increase in the spend. Yes. yes. Yeah. So the total yes. increase that they were proposing between what we originally thought we were going to do to now in June 24 is an extra 6.806 million. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's the 
Hey, how common were you that the industry can actually deliver mm. on this? Um, What's the capacity like? Really? We um, so part of what we. One of the things we're doing with this is actually thinking to have a reach of the right kind of work so that we can provide the contractors out there with um, information around what is coming up and where we it's anticipated to come up. So we've uh, put since the time just accounts one for that already. Um, and we'll be releasing that by this council um, signs off on this today um, to the contractor. There is some tail off happening in some other councils because of um, circumstances beyond their control. Um, so that, um, that could be freeing up some capacity. Um, you know, say other councils won't one council be on the other. It's pretty optimistic work sharing, isn't it? Uh, look, it is. Um, the work isn't complicated, yep. so that means that there's a lot of contractors who are able to do it. Like the most complicated project would probably be the Cromwell Water Treatment Plant, right? And that's one that we think will actually be in progress. So what we've done is um, redone the cash flow on that project. So we had um, budgeted for that to be completed at the 30th of June 2024, but we, we believe we'll be halfway through construction at that point. That's probably the most complicated one. Um, the rest of them are largely um, oh, pipes. pipes. Yeah, and um, we are getting interest from a, from some of the medium-sized contractors. And I think you know that the outlook on the economy is um, is is consequence for the outlook on the economy. They are looking at um, broadening their um, client base to include. Councils as well as developers, those ones that have been kind of focused on development, we're uh, more interested in our work at the moment. Thank you. And, and just to, sorry, again, just to reiterate, having a laid out like this, I think it's hugely beneficial mm. for entry. Mm. Genderism. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, the question around the water and West River development contributions and counting. Um, what is the in the forecasted um, income for Alexandria and Guam and other than the budget efficiency? Um, so it's around timing of work happening. So we do estimates based on the growth forecasts, and we we look like they're flat line, but in reality they don't occur like that. There's peaks and spikes. So um, you know there are some sizable developments underway at the moment and it's just around the timing of those coming online and those payments being made. Um, so what I, I don't know how do how far do all I go down the red hole of what happens to development contributions I mean, <laughs> post So so any development contribution that's paid before the 30th of June 2024 um council uses it for their programs, any that's been set but not paid by the 30th of June 2024 will be payable to the new board of entities. So the money will still come in, but it's, it's the timing. And look, we've had to approach our program in a completely different way because normally what happens in a council is you get to the end of the financial year, any capital program projects you have delivered, you just carry forward the funding. And we're in a situation where no carry forwards will happen. So we have to be really yeah, we're having to be take quite a hard line on that. Um, so we are tracking them every month, and, and if they start, we're talking with the um, development engineering team. We keep track of what um, developments have had development contribution notifications go out to them, and we're looking at the timing of those developments to kind of understand where they're coming in. So Chantelle's done her best estimate based on what we know from the developers doing those developments about when they'll get their 2 to 4 c sign up and when they'll pay their development contributions. Um, so, Martin and Tamer. October, we see a change of government, potentially, and as if they're saying that you know, Three Waters is going to be put the brakes on, where does that leave us? Um, so, where, where we are at the moment, and there's very clear direction from government on this at the moment, um, the Water Services Entities Bill was enacted on the 14th of December. That quite clearly states that councils are not to include three waters in their future planning. They're, 20, they're not to include it in their 2024 multi-flats. So um, given the LTP process will be kicking off soon, 
and everybody will be uh, working away on those and go out in consultation probably just around the, after the election. Um, there's going to be quite a, um, if, if, if there was to be a fundamental change in government policy on this, it's going to be quite a complex thing to turn around. So, yeah, all that's going to have to be worked through. So I don't think we should worry about that. It was the one I think we were yes, told on. what we legally would be told to do at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, back in August, we direct appointed Fluid Solutions to do some work for the TVF, which they then could not do, and it was farmed out to other companies. Has that impacted on our ability to capture that data in a timely manner? Or? Uh, well, no. Like we, um, we got that pipeline down the hill and rocks were done pretty quickly. It, you know, we were trying to share the work around the consultants, but the reality is well, what they told us is the consultants are pretty busy. Um, yeah, so the larger firms probably had more capacity um, to, to move things around within their programs. So um, small consultants that have got a job and they don't have the capacity in other work jobs as well. So is that probably just something we would be considering in the future? Yeah. Right. Um, thanks, Nigel. Um, Martin asked the really valid question of whether the, the contractors can handle this. My question is, what about this organisation? Because mm -hmm. we've got into here and into the coaching, no doubt, happen. Um, we know how to stretch the staff are. We've seen the pressure that the current massive work program has put on staff, put on your team. Can you be what surety can we have that the organisation can handle this kind of program? Yes, yeah, so, so we're really aware of that. Um, what I would say is the project delivery team um, are largely not uh, being having transition demands put on them to the same extent that the operations team will have. Um, she tells a bit of a worry because she will um, have transition workload as well as um, council workload um, landing on her. So we, we're really conscious of that and we're managing it. What I would say is at the moment, every member of that team is pretty critical um, mm -hmm. and, and losing staff is, is really going to cause us some problems and we're aware of that and we're trying to manage that. Could I add that we had no staff poached by either the NCW or the entity. We had one, had one staff member from CODC go to uh, NTU through an advertised role. Um, they, look, they are, that, what I would say is that um, the NTU and the DIA and, and NTD, we expect to hear the CE is going to be today, um, they are immensely aware that if we don't deliver our programs, they're going to have to deliver our programs um, as soon as they're established. So that they're not, they're not out to kind of um, Jeopardise that work you're making in the brain. Still got a job to do that, haven't you? Sure. Um, this is just further to what Martin was talking about with regard. Um, I was just, didn't you say that the DIA are looking at everybody's law yeah. council's agenda? So really, we don't have a choice in terms of what we, when we want to, to do all this, do we? Really? Yeah. No, you, you have a choice, it's just they have to confirm your decision. So they've actually put out, since um, we wrote this report, which was um, largely done before Christmas, um, there's been some more guidance come out around what they're monitoring requirement or how they're going to implement their monitoring notes and so requirements. So basically, if we make um, a change to our program that really impacts in a, um, a debt increase of more than 25 million, then that's a significant decision on what or it's a $10 million kind of project change. So we don't even have projects that meet that threshold. Um, so we, what we have to do is every report that comes in front of you for a decision has to be sent to the DIA and they it goes into an extended decision, but not a significant decision. Um, box and then things that are significant, they, they had to confirm those decisions. So um, while we thought this report would require fair confirmation, um, we, we don't believe now that it, it does, we think it falls in that intended decision rather than significant decision because you're not changing what the scheme. Yeah, um, it's just 
just looking at this in the deferred work in relation to Omicow and Vinnie Toto, um, but in particular Omicow, um, I completely understand that it's a lot bigger than what we originally thought and there's going to be some significant changes. Are we, I guess my concern is that by doing all this other stuff, are we at risk and given um, having team available to do it, are we at risk of um, in the mini photo work being pushed further back and pushed further back? Yeah, um, so I, I think you raised a very good point that we probably overlooked. Um, we probably need to go out to those communities and give them an update on what, what we're actually looking at um, there. Um, and I know Patrick's behind me. With the business case development work is well in training of both the many total supplies and home account. And Patrick, is that is the first report coming on that at the end of March? Yeah. So once we get that first request, it would make sense to do um, a media releases to for those and a, and a communications update to those communities about what it's currently looking like we would be doing, what we're considering and what um, would happen because I think once they understand that, they will be quite supportive of the decision that's being taken. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so Jim has um, made it apply for me to carry on that business case for people. And the background so that doesn't just get dropped. Yeah. There is still a problem. It's awesome, thank you. There's no question on the most rules. There's probably three key projects from this district that need to be addressed in the future. And one's the um, cow water, um, one's the Manitoto water upgrades, and the other one's the Alexander Oma cow wastewater treatment. Um, all, all three of those things need to be done to meet legal requirements and so there's no chance of them not remaining a, a priority um, because there'll be prosecutions occur if those projects don't get progressed. Thank you. Okay. Everyone? There's no further questions. I'll oh, then ask for recommendations A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. Do I have a mover and a second? I have to move that. Martin and Ian. Any further discussion? All those in favour? Um, yes. Carried. Thank you. And can I just say to the Waters team, just thank you for that piece of work. Oh I was going, going through my mind it's like the oh. analogy of the man is going to be hung tomorrow it concentrates the mind wonderful wonderful <laughs> and I think that's what this shows the, it, it's really clarifies just what's got to be got through and that's yeah. a lot of ideas yeah. so thank that's you skew us now Rogan. Yeah, just, <laughs> yeah. just much help from Neil. We can now go on to the first part of the roading model with the last one that came up. Welcome. Uh, good morning. I'll we'll back the report as um, brief. So the current roading bylaw was updated in 2020 and adopted 18th of November 2020. This was following a review of the 2015 bylaw, which recommended some minor amendments and it was designed to modernise and simplify the existing bylaw. An update to the roading, 2020 roading bylaw is proposed to, to make two amendments. The proposed amendments are to restrict parking on footpaths and cycle paths, and alignment of parking enforcement fees to the land transport offences and penalties regulations 1999. Um, so the current bylaw um, restricts parking on bridges, however, it does not refer to parking on footpaths or cycle paths. Um, and the land transport rules specifies no person may park on a footpath or cycle path. It is proposed um, an addition is made to reflect this rule. Um, the second one around the, the alignment of fees to the Land Transport Act. Um, so a graduated scale of fines reflects the offence and alignment to the Land Transport um, Act and it's a method um, used by councils um, throughout um, New Zealand. Um, 
So alongside um, the proposed update, um, just an update around parking and parking enforcement. So um, we are updating our systems um, with new technology to enable more efficient issuing and processing of parking infringements. So the technology will also ensure statutory timeframes and met with reminder notices sent automatically on time. Any unpaid fines are automatically lodged with the report as well. Um, one other note, um, I just <laughs> noted a uh, error in the statement of proposal um, on page 77 of the agenda um, that references public template before finalising setting any new speed limits. Um, it should read council wants to hear views and feedback on our proposed amendment under the consultation details. So it's um, I'll come back to the chair for any questions. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, I just, it's a question and an observation is that, that as part of this consultation process, I feel sure we will get feedback about the enforcement, mm -hmm. either lack thereof <laughs> or um, too much. However, I, I think that it's going to be really important we are prepared for that and have some observations to make about saying not only we've got a, a decent ticket system in place, we're actually going to be doing some enforcing because. That, that to me will be what this is going to probably get more feedback on than anything else. And I really look forward to being proved off by the community. Um, if, I, if I can respond to that, Neil, I totally agree. Um, we know one of the reasons why we need to progress this is because the um, the strain on some of the car parking in some areas, and we've actually had it suggested to us that we need to get on in a mm -hmm. yeah. so, so we'll get it from both. Mm. Otherwise, I think it's, 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 it's timely, it's good um, getting the, the, having some teeth in terms of the, the fines and commitment to other stuff that happens elsewhere so we're consistent, not really in the wheel. And that's good sense. So let's now get out there and, and use the tool um, without being, um, I'd say that anymore, I'm not allowed to do that, no, um, without being seen to be, um, you yeah. know, like, um, not sure or something. Um, I guess my big concern, and this kind of follows on from what Neil was saying, is that uh, we need to be consistent. And I think that in particular, this is going to hit people in Alexandra and in Cromwell the most. Um, so, um, and, I, and it really stuck in my mind about the parking on Verges. I mean, I think all around everywhere, in the district, especially outside of our um, urban centres, everybody parks on the verge. And I'm not sure how you're going to police that, but we need to be consistent and it's and um, I agree we are potentially going to open ourselves up for some criticism on that front. So I'm not sure how we Yep, um yeah, noted there's um increasing um complaints. Um, yeah. laid around vehicles parking on footpaths or boats or caravans or different things. Um, people choose pushing prams and they are moving out onto a carriageway to mm -hmm. pass that around. There might be a bend in the street um, and it is it is unsafe. Um, and at the moment we can send a letter um, and if there is no response to that letter we don't have any around that yeah. to infringe and encourage people to remove that item off the footpath or where it works. Creating safety issues. Yeah, I know. Yes. Yeah. And, and we've clearly got a, um, a bit of time while the Bible goes through the consultation process, and then we need to think about how we resource this and yeah. how we communicate those into the local people and together as to our approach to ensure we are consistent. And I believe there is an enforcement strategy being developed, which looks at enforcement across the council as a whole, um, and it, it, it's will be brought to council and then priorities can be set around enforcement as well from the resource that can do happen. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, that was some sort of question I have. I, I, look, I have a family of five teenage boys and seven cars, right? Mm -hmm. And most of them live on the verge, on the grass verge. So, you know, they're quite conscious of the footpaths clear, but they're, they're parked up on the grass. And it's on, you know, some of our streets around here and Alex, the verge is quite wide and it sort of leads itself, that sort of thing. So, education will be the first port of call show will be. Yeah. 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 
but then they'll be saying they've got to remove them if they're not going to be subject to fines. Yes. Yes. I haven't looked at the policy, but someone just said something about verges and streets, and I thought of cul de sacs. <coughs> And parking there in, and I'm wondering if there's anything about parking bottle that actually clarifies the situation about people parking at the end of cul de sacs. Like from angle parking to parking up on the curb to try to make the car bend in half and park on the curb. Uh, just, I, I don't believe there's any um, reference to parking in cul de sac heads in terms of allowing other vehicles. Um, mm. It would be interesting to see if we get any feedback about it, but it's something that comes up from time to time. Um, and I haven't heard a lot of it, but yeah. Um, yeah. I'm to read them. It's a yellow thing. Yeah, great. and there's also provisions under the land transport um, in terms of fines for inconsiderate parking. Um, mm. But that's that's mm. um, then from an opinion in terms of fine under inconsiderate parking um, and ask for the removal of vehicles. Um, but again, could line mark. Yellow, yellow line, um, policy. Yeah, lots of policy. It's supposed to look, and we'll see a lot of paint for no good reason. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just, yeah, I'll, I will do some further research. I'm not going to hold things up, but I'll just following up from people parking on bridges, I've noticed, particularly out the front of my place this year, people parking actually on the park under the trees because their cars get hot. So, yeah, you know, it, it goes that far as well. Since we had about four in one day, mostly holiday homes. Uh, nah, it's the pits to smack cricket things around that account. Yeah. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wolf through the windscreen. It does, it does work quite well, though. Most of like it at the LCG, they have cricket matches with people park all around the park. I think that's different. These are people parking the car there all day and not in, but they're. Well, uh, you should see what it's like. Instead of their driver. It's all big down. Hmm. Hey, anything else? I'm not a movie recommendation. Okay, <laughs> Second up. Thank you. All in favour? Aye. 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 Right. Let's get this thing going back into the bridge funding. Oh, good on again. Thank you. I'll take the report as it's been read. Um, so, Bridge 93 is located on St. Clinton's Loop. That's 6.8 kilometres from the intersection of Wooded Barrow and Vex Road. Um, following two significantly heavy rainfall events in July and of 2022. We experienced significant erosion um, to the mudstone layer around the bridge abutments. It's, it's known as blue clay. Um, almost half of the true right, um, so in, in figure three, the um, left hand side here, um, of the abutment was undermined um, with no poles supporting the abutment. So we had a, um, a, immediately had a specialist bridge and engineer um, inspect, and some restrictions were put on that structure. Um, while we could do some temporary work, while the river levels were still high, um, to prefer to check the structure and then an engineering solution to stabilise the bridge and provide ongoing protection was completed um, in collaboration with Copenhagen and Santec. Um, following that, um, we made an application to Waka Kotahi under the Emergency Works um, funding, um, which has been approved and that is um, subject to um, us, us providing a, a local share. Um, with the 103,986 to be funded by council. Um, so the recommended um, option um, is to fund the council share um, from the roaming emergency reserve account. Um, an alternative option um, listed is to fund from uh, the local share of unsubsidized roaming improvement program um, discussed in financial considerations. Um, however, this will limit um, future work and a report has not come back to council on the use of that fund. Um, so again, this could be considered as part of that, as part of that journal report if, if requested, but um, for now option one is the recommended, um, or alternatively option three discusses um, using from existing bridging budgets, but that does not make use of the Waka Kotaki cost share, um, and it also limits the remaining work we can undertake in bridge maintenance. Oh, and that's a issue for question. Thank you very much for that. How long did it take for them to come around with the funding once the process started? Or was it pretty? It's, it is it is reasonably quick. Like, um, so they they basically we have to um submit data around the rainfall and um yeah. event and demonstrate that it was a significant 
rainfall yeah. um, and um, details on what the, the solution was and had all the funding and uh, costs in as well. Any questions? No. Just one steer and I know the answer will be that that um, 634k is not, nothing else pending that we're going to need to dip into that for at the moment. But um, well, there was a portion of projects that were not funded um, yeah. through that um, and we considered a range of those, but um, we were going to get more details um, on what the plan looks like um, to that June meeting. Um, okay. We did commit to the ceiling of Wonderful Point Road yeah. as part of that. Um, and then considerations on that money um, will be made um, at a later date. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Um, my question is more about the, the cause and is, 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 it, is it understood just what happens? Is somebody having further upstream or somebody having the bridge itself or you know, the weather cause them? But I've had situations before where some poor decisions and maintenance upstream have caused issues that have no, it wasn't, it wasn't it wasn't driven around willows falling and yeah. dragging down or, or, or different things like that. It was um really isolated rainfall yeah. um that hit quite that St. Bethlehem's Falls Dam area quite heavy. Um and it just um the yeah, the river level come up and it just started um a road that the clay lag quite quickly, but um the fix will preserve that layer um, and there's um, good channeling and everything to direct river flow um, a future events. So the channel was all off for start or was it, was it, or was it a bit greater? Uh, it's, 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 it's fine, it's just, it's just at that layer where it comes under the bridge. Very good. Anyone else? No, I have a movement. Movement, Tracy, Taylor, all those in favour? Right. Yes, Kara. Thank you very much, Tim. Yep. Bridges, eh? Wonderful things. Aren't they great? Mm -hmm. This one's all like that. So it's it's good. Good. Yeah. You just need to get over them. Thank you very much. I made the jokes. Yeah, Dan Jacks brought to you by the news today. All righty, my go. My go. Still going. That is our policy policy. It gives me joy. The policy is policy. Welcome, Alex. This is um, this is good stuff. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> um, you've got me for a few items. Sure. Friday. Yeah, fearing a terror, turning the photo. Namaji or Titaho. Greetings for the new year. Um, you've got me for a few items in a row today. <laughs> First is the policies policy, which is yeah, the deputy meeting's favourite. I think it's the most bureaucratic thing I've ever said to them. <laughs> and they very much enjoyed at Water and Risk having a meeting about the meeting on policy on policy. <laughs> 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 with, <laughs> with apologies, I've just noticed that the policy policy didn't actually attach to the agenda. Um, I did have COVID when I wrote this one, so that's probably the reason rather than something systemic. So there's a copy around here now, but we can also, also talk it through. And this piece of work um, comes with or from a larger piece of work we did with the Ordinary Risk Committee throughout the last term um, to develop a framework for the treatment of our policies to improve the quality of the policies themselves. Obviously, our work, because the better policies are, the better work is, and our reporting to auditors. And this policy is the summation of that work. So it largely won't be new to you as we've come up with each new initiative we've done and implemented it. Um, it includes the allocation of responsibility for maintaining our policies, including both the existence of the policy register and the maintenance of that. And for those who aren't in order to list, that's a list of all policies, what they are and when they expire, that is taken to every audit and risk committee. Um, the policy also includes the timeframes for the renewals of all policies and any exceptions to those timeframes which are generally those certain legislation. And it includes the process for closing off or archiving the policy, which is the area which is different to what we have done in the past. And the new policies policy asks that the same decision maker who approved the policy also approves its retirement. That means a policy that was passed by this body will need to come back to this body before it is discontinued. This policy, also includes a compliance target, 80% of our policies to be in date at any one time. 
Um, that target both the committee and our recommendation is that it's too low. However, it's set through the long term plan process. So that's our next opportunity to change it and we can bring the policy back for a minor update and um, looking to improve our performance to about 90%, which is consistent with our current status of I think we're at 90.75 percent current right now. And I believe that is everything contained in the policy, so I'll pop back to the chair, but I understand you may need a moment to take a look at <laughs> It we didn't have it in front of us at all, but there was no changes. I think we had it on the back of my business. And you gave me two. You asked for an adjustment to the text around the explanation of the policy and to add the responsibility for maintaining the register of both around yeah. that. The ones we asked for the money. Yeah. yeah. And then recommended three years. So, councillors, any questions? I'm happy to move. Thank you. Nigel, Tanya, are you seeking? Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favour? No. Aye. No. No. Against? Carry it. Perhaps this to the much less enjoyably named <laughs> fraud, bribery, and corruption. <laughs> 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 those bottles of wine, guys. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think going on, mate. And this is our policy that's concerned with deliberate acts of dishonesty. So we do have quite a suite of policies in place to protect us from corruption, fraud and financial mismanagement. And this one is the deliberate acts of dishonesty. It was adopted in 2020 to deal with all actual or suspected incidences, and it's reviewed annually because that's the best practice guidelines from the Office of the Auditor General. It's owned by Business Support and the Executive Manager of Business Support, and I have done this review on their behalf. It's a soft review, um, which involves checking for updates to legislation and ensuring it's working correctly. The substance of the policy does make the advice of the Office of the Auditor General and it has been found to still be fit and relevant. There were a lot of updates made to the and the policy itself and those were references to our policies that have changed and most notably the protected disclosures whistleblowers act 2022 which we have a separate policy relating to and they work side by side. The update also resets some of the responsibilities to match the changes within that department. So the broad control officer is now the general manager of business support, and the new policy has lifted the reporting requirements for suspected fraud up from the level of the manager of the person suspected all the way to executive level because we felt and the advice of the order was that was a much more appropriate level. I sought their feedback on the policy on the 15th of December and they recommend it be re uh, re adopted for three, so with the following changes. Um, there was some adjustment to the wording around complaints relating to the chief executive to ensure that these were investigated by an independent agency. <laughs> Clarification that any complaints about the CEO would not automatically be disclosed to the CEO. <laughs> and then some minor grammar and wording changes um, and all of those have been made. The committee recommended we update the policy for two more years with a review to take place after 12 months. And the reason for that is the change to the way we want to treat these annual policies. Uh, we have had a couple of them expire in the past in that annual cycle, which is not ideal if the annual cycle policies tend to have a higher legislative requirement, which is why we're reviewing them annually. But that's up in the workload pressure. So we've decided that we may have a approach to put them onto a two-year cycle, but renew them annually. So if any changes of workload prioritisation take place, those policies don't risk falling out of compliance with the relevant acts. And back to you. Yeah. Questions, Council? I've got one just in relation to the issue of if there's an allegation made against the CEO, and you said that that was picked up, and I'm still looking at our page 179, and it says that the GMs of people in cultural business support must report to the CEO. 
I thought that was what we were training. That is what we were training. Yeah, I've changed that ask room with policy and must have had ones in the night. So with that will be backstairs per or will be risky. All right, in that case, then I'll take us back to page uh, 172 A and B. I'll move A and B with the exception that B will say, um, we'll just add as amended so that that can put in. We know what we mean by that. Yep, yep. I'll move that. Time off second. All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Against. Carried. Thank you very much. And now the last of your trifecta is the CCTV policy. CCTV, yes. So council has six fixed CCTV cameras and two roaming CCTV cameras currently. And the roaming ones are used by infrastructure. And that is the potential to install further cameras in areas where there are instances of bandits and against our property. Previously, each of these cameras has had an individual policy relating to it, and most policies have lapsed. So we're proposing to put one general policy in that governs all CCTV use, and that's this policy. Yeah. There's two primary pieces of legislation to consider, as well as our own requirements. The most obvious one being the Privacy Act 2020, and the secondary one being the Local Government Official Information and Meetings Act 1987. Um, that they all be familiar with them before you know, process where all data is discoverable fault by an individual and CCTV footage is considered personal data. So we need to have processes in place around that, that balance that right with the privacy of any other individual appearing in the footage. So the intent of this policy is to guide our CCTV use, provide the instruction around the installation of new cameras and to reflect full compliance with both those pieces of legislation. It applies only to cameras owned by Central Otago District Council, not cameras that shops or private owners. <laughs> because of the nature of this policy, it's got a really comprehensive suite of policy documents that sit beside it. It has a CCTV procedure that has specific information for staff around how they can comply with this policy and adhere to it an approvals process with several steps, including a privacy impact assessment, a technical assessment, a staff impact assessment, and then all the usual budget and property processes still apply. Um, and there is a CCTV access log for each camera that both digitally and manually records all access to show that it has a clear business purpose. We're also seeking permission from this meeting to develop a memorandum of understanding with the police around their access to our footage. And that's really us being incredibly thorough. The police have their own CCTV camera that shows how they use it. And all the MOZ really does is ensure that if there are any changes to that. In the event we had some very wild political swing in the government that we would be notified of the change to that access before we would give them our footage. So they fairly straightforward there. And in addition to that, our whole range of cyber security and protection of information measures still apply to make sure that all of our technical data is safe from hackers and things like that. So it's really comprehensive. It's taken us quite a long time to work through um, and is largely ready to go. Uh, so all of those those documents have been drafted and the next step will be to take them for executive approval. The policy includes a public notification process of signage and a requirement that no footage is stored for more than 30 days, which our technology automatically does for us. So there's no risk of storing side of. However, we've allowed to hold that footage longer for the investigation of an incident. And to be really clear, that's intended not only to cover criminal incidents, and health and safety of human resource incidents and anything that we would follow an investigative process for after which the footage would be destroyed. So the request today is to adopt this policy for a period of three years and to authorise the CEO to develop and manage the memorandum with the police for the ongoing access to any footage for the investigation of spying Alrighty. Any questions? Other people put their hand up, you just put it first. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Jim, Christian is the only one I've got. I've got a couple, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you see, we've got six. Yeah. Um, 